there are competitions between nation states. And these are not just between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. Um, they're over between lots of different countries over large and small pieces of territory. Um, the Republic of Ireland and England over uh, Northern Ireland, etc. And the question is, whose um, influence is going to hold in whatever territory that is? Or to put it slightly differently, uh, who's going to get to dominate the decision-making process? Well, this um, is, I mention this because the idea of domination over a global decision-making process is a part of the problem that makes it impossible to solve. So we have to, on some level, figure out how to transcend domination as a method of political decision making. So far, what we have is the United Nations, the World Court, uh, International Court of Justice. The uh, We have international peacekeeping forces. We have various international mediators. None of this is even close to being enough. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm here tonight with Dr. Ken Cloak. Dr. Cloak is a world-recognized mediator, facilitator, teacher, and conflict resolution systems designer. He's the author of numerous books and articles and a pioneer in the field of mediation and conflict resolution for over 40 years. He received a JD, that is a, a doctoral degree in jurisprudence, from UC Berkeley in 1966 and a PhD in history from UCLA in 1980. Three years later, he created the so-called Center for Dispute Resolution in Santa Monica, California, and he was the principal founder of Mediators Beyond Borders, a nonprofit organization focused on creating peace through mediation. Dr. Cloak, thank you so much for coming online today. Thank you for inviting me, Pascal. So um, let's start this first segment on conflict uh, revolution and conflict resolution uh, and the, these books that you wrote and your views on how conflict and mediation works. Because as far as I understand, you've been working for a large part of your life mediating personal conflicts or institutional conflicts. But in your recent work, you, you went far beyond that and you started also working on uh, conflict as a, as a systematic issue and also politics, including war as one form of, of, of conflict. Could you maybe tell us very briefly about um, how you got there and how you view the, 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 the phenomenon of conflict today? Wonderful, beautiful question, uh, and one that will take in at least an hour uh, to answer, perhaps uh, a few years. Um, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, what exactly is conflict? And we can come up with a variety of explanations and definitions for conflict. Here are some of the ones that make sense to me. Uh, conflict is a place where we are stuck. And so the question then becomes, why are we stuck? What is it that gets us stuck? And what is it that gets us unstuck? Uh, one of the things that gets us stuck is a lack of skill at being able to handle someone else's behavior. But another thing that gets us stuck um, is an inability to evolve or adapt to changing conditions. And we can see this uh, in marriages, we can see it in organizations, and we can see it in political states. Um, we become invested in the status quo. Uh, we become uh, simply used to it. Uh, we accommodate to it in a variety of ways. But of course, uh, impermanence is one of the characteristics of life. Nothing remains the same. Um, and so whatever it is that we uh, did to succeed in the old 
uh, paradigm becomes counterproductive when a new paradigm begins to arise. And then what is set up is um, a classic set of responses, some of which are very similar to the ones identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, uh, corresponding to the stages of death and dying. First comes denial. Uh, nothing is changing. Uh, there are no problems. There is no conflict. Um, and we can see this in our interpersonal um, relationships, but we can also see it at a political level. And so what we discover is that conflicts um, are what are called scale-free phenomena. From a scientific perspective, this means they are what are called fractals. Uh, a fractal is a form of self-organization that is self-similar on all scales. So you, if you look at the coastline of Japan uh, from a mile uh, up, it will look essentially the same as it looks uh, at a thousandth of an inch. So in other words, the patterns are self-similar on all scales. A mountain range looks very similar at a distance and up close. Uh, and I believe that conflict is like this. And what this allows us to do then is to um, translate methods and techniques that work on a small scale um, to ones that might possibly work with some, ad some adaptation on a much larger scale. So um, we can now go back to our definition of conflict and say that conflict is simply the sound made by the cracks in a system, a marital system, a family system, uh, an organizational system, a social system, a political system. And what is required then is uh, a set of methods, first of all, for uh, overcoming um, denial. And then after denial come a series of other responses um, blaming the messenger, um, uh, trying to bargain uh, and kind of get out of this by small um, tweaks and, you know, tiny little changes and reforms uh, that will hopefully make a difference. Um, but when something systemic um, is changing, um, what happens is that the system um, begins to seriously resist because um, uh, everything within that system could be transformed as a result of whatever it is that is changing. Um, if conflict is the sound made by the cracks in a system, then it is also one of the first indicators of a paradigm shift. Uh, of the birth of some new way of being that isn't yet comprehended um, uh, or uh, uh, adapted to. Uh, and so what mediation and all the various conflict resolution arts and sciences are designed to do, essentially, um, is to help people see uh, what the problem is. So um, one of the methods that we have, for example, is to separate the person from the problem, be soft on the person and hard on the problem. This comes is straight out of Roger Fisher and William Erie's book, Getting the Yes. Um, and so the idea is um, to sidestep the natural tendency on all of these levels, on all of these scales, to shoot the messenger, to blame the one who is identifying the problem as being the source of the problem. Um, and instead say, um, let's look at the problem not as a you, but as an it. And once we do that, denial kind of loses its edge. Uh, it ceases to be so powerful. And then the question becomes, um, 
particularly when there are systemic changes. Uh, okay, the system is changing. Um, what's the new system? Well, the difficulty is in any moment of transition, what we have is an old system that isn't working and a new system that's only partially revealed itself. Mm -hmm. So nobody really knows the answer to that question. And because we don't know the answer to that question, people are frightened. They feel insecure. Um, if we use as a simple example, um, parent teenager conflicts. Um, in every family where there are parents and teenagers, there are conflicts over, for example, what time you're going to be home. And we can see that in these conflicts, everybody blames everybody else. The parents say you're irresponsible to the teenager. The teenager says you're controlling um, and manipulative to the parents, etc. And none of that um, gets us any closer to solving the problem. So what exactly is the problem? Well, as soon as we ask that question, we shift from a process that is organized around positions to a process that is organized around interests. A position is what you want, an interest is why you want it. So in the beginning, the very first uh, approach to this conflict is for the parent to just say, I'm sorry, I'm in charge here. You're going to be at home by 10 o'clock or you're in trouble. You'll be punished. Um, and we can think of that as a one dimensional approach to problem solving. That is all that we require is one answer. We have one input and that's it. And that's whatever the parent says, whatever the boss says, whatever the dictator says. And so we can see that on all of these levels, one dimensionality is essentially a response to the um, uh, anarchy which, and the chaos which are unleashed by conflict, the fear of conflict, uh, the, the lack of knowing exactly where it's heading. Um, and um, the effort to impose from the outside uh, a solution by force, if necessary, um, punishment or whatever the equivalent will be. Uh, so that's the first step. And it makes sense what, because uh, one of the first responses to chaos is to impose order on the chaos. And that's going to work for a period of time. But when you're talking about a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, that's not going to work anymore. And now what we have is a shift from a one-dimensional approach to a two-dimensional approach. What are the two dimensions? What the parents want and what the teenager wants. And we have shifted out of dictatorship into a kind of parliamentary process uh, in which parties have different uh, positions that they have adopted. They have goals. The parent says, you're going to be home by 10 o'clock. The teenager says, I want to be home by two. What is the outcome of any two-dimensional problem-solving process? Answer, compromise. So whatever the outcome is going to be, if we imagine a two-dimensional surface as consisting of an x-axis and a y-axis, anything that isn't either 10 o'clock or 2 p.m., 2 a.m., mm -hmm. is a compromise. And that goes for any number of different kinds of disputes, but we can see it very clearly with regard to teenage disputes, and then we can elaborate that, broaden it. The third dimension occurs when we move away from positions and create depth. That is a three-dimensional problem-solving mechanism. What's the third dimension? It can be emotions. How does it feel to you? Well, that's a different conversation. We've now got a different relationship. We've got different outcomes. We've got different process. 
or it can be interest, which is why does that matter to you? Why does it feel so important to you? And everything shifts when you move in that direction. Um, and you have a great deal of creativity in your conversations with one another and in your problem solving approaches when you add an extra dimension to the problem solving process. So now here's the question and we can keep going. What we discover if we keep going is that um, each of these new dimensions makes the skills that were appropriate at a lower dimension outmoded, no longer useful. You now require a new higher order of skills. All you require in order to be able to solve the problem dictatorially um, is to know what the dictator wants and do it and not question it. But if you move into negotiation, you have to know what you want and you have to be able to negotiate. You have to be able to find compromises and solutions that, you know, kind of work somehow uh, or at least end up somewhere in the middle. And with interests, what we require are now a much, much higher order of skill because what is required in an interest-based conversation about curfew, about what time you're going to be home, is more nuanced, more subtle, more collaborative than any of the ones that came before. And what we discover is um, it isn't about 10 p.m. or 2 a.m. It's about feeling like you're in charge of your life, like making sure your child is safe. So if we ask, what is your interest to the parents? They'll say safety is one of their interests. Um, so now, uh, and the teenager will say having fun. So um, which one is right? Safety or having fun? Well, they're both right. Meaning we've moved out of either or into both and. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what we require are all these higher order skills. And the last point about this, two last points. One is... Um, what will happen predictably if you have a three-dimensional problem and you approach it using only two-dimensional skills? And the answer is you'll get stuck. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to solve the problem. There will be that clash, as you suggested. Um, and you can only get to the bottom of the problem by deepening the systems, the structures, the relationships, the conversations that take place. Politically, this is the difference between debate and dialogue. Debate is a two-dimensional process in which there are two sides and only one of those sides can win. But in dialogue, we have multiple options. There aren't sides anymore. There are um, uh, creative approaches. And now what we're looking for is an outcome in which nobody loses, in which everybody wins something important to them. How do we get there? It's not so easy. We have to do it through conversation, through discovery, through listening, through um, um, collaborative uh, thinking, uh, etc. How many dimensions are there? Um, well, according to a very famous uh, mathematician, there are, uh, Bernard Riemann, uh, there are an infinite number. But we know of at least six or seven in conflict resolution beyond these first three or four that I've mentioned. And um, maybe I need to add at this point that this is the first time that we talk and that you wrote a really extensive number of books um, and it's it's an impossible task to pick your mind in just one hour. Uh, and you just you just gave us like a, a very good overview of how you view conflict in a nutshell. And it clearly comes out of of interpersonal conflict and conflict resolution. But at the same time, in one of your books that you did, that you did, uh, published in 2006 at the crossroads of conflict already, you develop an entire the the. The, the beginning of a, a theory, a general theory on conflict, um, and 
what I just heard from you is part of what you what you present there. You give us like six or seven basic elements of conflict that uh, that conflict includes chaos, entropy, symmetry, spectrum, and it, it, that there's an entire conflict field. So just to our viewers, your your views go very very deep, and I, I believe that you're just giving us this, the the most important bites in order to to get an uh, an intuitive understanding. But if I now take you to the task and say lay and and ask you Ken. Uh, from what you told us also about interpersonal conflict and if we take that to the international relations realm and we look at two conflicts that are currently going on one at an extreme end of the spectrum which is war between yeah. Russia and Ukraine and another one which is which is boiling on a lower end of the spectrum but which has every pot uh, possible potential to become just as horrible which is the conflict between uh, China, the United States, and Taiwan in the middle. Can you give me your thoughts about what to do about both of these conflicts and how they could be approached with your theory? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and yes, you're quite right. This becomes intricate um, and quite beautiful uh, in the way that mathematics uh, can be quite beautiful. Um, mm. Many, um, uh, several centuries ago, um, uh, a man, a, sci a scientist, his name is Maxwell, wrote a series of equations about unifying electricity and magnetism. And the way that he unified them was through the creation of a field. Um, and in a similar way, Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, is a field theory. Um, well, if you take as an example, where is electricity located? Well, the answer is it isn't located just in a single spot. It is spread out over a field. And we can see this simply by taking a magnet in a sheet of paper and sprinkling iron filings on the top of it and shaking it. And you will see that it will create uh, a kind of um pattern showing what the yes exactly uh what the magnetic field looks like and in a similar kind of way i think we can think about um conflicts as um leading us to a field theory which does not yet exist so now if we take a look at the planet as a whole we can see several things um and if we consider the planet as a field, um, we can see um, with regard to, and before we get into war, we can take a look at a couple of somewhat simpler um, uh, issues like COVID and climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and what we can see with regard to COVID is um, viruses do not respect national borders they cross right over them. Climate change um, cannot be solved through military force or through litigation. Um, and so if we eliminate the two principal methods of resolution, um, and we also look at what the structure is that gives rise to those methods, that is, the creation of the nation state, we can see that the problems that we are facing as a planet have outstripped the nation state. It's simply not big enough, not capable enough to solve any of these problems. And so that's our paradigm shift. What do we do now? And what that's I'm mentioning this because we can see that on a smaller scale um, with regard to who has the right to control what territories, um, there are competitions between nation states. And these are not just between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. Um, they're over between lots of different countries over large and small pieces of territory. Um, the Republic of Ireland and England over uh, Northern Ireland, etc. And the question is, whose um, influence is going to hold in whatever territory that is? 
or to put it slightly differently, uh, who's going to get to dominate the decision-making process? Well, this um, is, I mentioned this because the idea of domination over a global decision-making process is a part of the problem that makes it impossible to solve. So we have to, on some level, figure out how to transcend domination as a method of political decision making. So far, what we have is the United Nations, the World Court, uh, International Court of Justice. The uh, We have international peacekeeping forces. We have various international mediators. None of this is even close to being enough. So... Um, here's what's um, missing in uh, uh, in Russia, in uh, Ukraine, in uh, U.S. and China relations, uh, all of this. Um, actually, Louis, let me start with a wonderful quote from Margaret Atwood, a Canadian novelist, um, who said that, uh, in quotes, war is what happens when language fails. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, we can see that war happens also when people are demonized, Mm -hmm. when they are disrespected, when cultures are not uh, uh, respected, uh, when needs are unaddressed, interests unsatisfied, when pressing problems are ignored, uh, when intense emotions like people's love for their country or whatever it may happen to be, are left unheard, unacknowledged. Uh, When conflicts are allowed to fester, um, they uh, essentially they turn very small, preventable, easily resolvable differences into immense, unavoidable, intractable crises where violence seems like it's the only way out. So there is a fundamental, simple solution, which is dialogue. Um, But it's more complex than that. So let's add one more simplicity. Every mountain was a molehill once. And opportunities for preventing it from escalating and turning violent um, were um, completely ignored. Uh, And so Ukraine, we can see, is a failure not only of language, but a failure of caring, a failure of listening, a failure of imagination, of skill, of determination, uh, of even a desire um, to make things work, uh, to find ways uh, for people to get along. Um, The problem is that we are now in the period in which there are nuclear weapons that Mm -hmm. can easily um, wipe out most of life on the planet. So, uh, and a second, I think, realization is Russia and China are going nowhere. Mm -hmm. They are on this planet for good. And the only question is, how do we handle our differences? Here's where uh, conflict resolution comes in. Yes, Pascal. You know, in your in, in, in your book, The Crossroads of Conflict, one of the one of the concepts that you champion is the idea of of chaos and entropy. And if I understand you correctly, you're saying that one of the of the benchmarks of the hallmarks of conflict is that we lose information during conflict. Conflict becomes in in lack of another word, dumb. We become stupid about it. It looks like very simple and then boom. And the only solution to the very simple problem is like very simple violence, right? In order to get the peace I want. Whereas uh, for conflict resolution, you need to re-add information. And one thing that I'm witness that I'm real that we are seeing right now is how the conflict between Russia and Ukraine or Russia and the West is dumped down 
to the most fundamental and the, stup the most dumbest of all things is like one nation against another. And it's clearly, clearly more complex than that, right? I mean, the Ukraine conflict is at least, uh, even the, the construction, the political situation within Ukraine is at least as complex as was it what it was in Yugoslavia. And all of that is in the public perception, at least in the West, completely thrown out of the window. Yep. So my question is, how do we get the complexity back, the information back in order to first get a two get, go to a two dimensional uh, model yep. and then again to a th multi dimensional model in order to find what 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 is a win win situation, right? If for uh, in order for everybody to get something, thereby lay down the weapons and and and, and get peace back. Brilliant, brilliant question, Pascal. Thank you for that. Um, uh the um there is there's a thing that i call social entropy and i think that the second law of thermodynamics is useful as a metaphor for looking at how um um uh the uh, oversimplification of complex problems is itself a part of the problem and prevents us from being able to solve them. Uh, now, it doesn't necessarily prevent us from being able to think that we can solve them, um, but the actual solution is something else. Uh, there's a famous quotation from Adolf Hitler, who said, in quotes, the German people were facing very difficult, very complex problems. I made them simple. And there are two simple ways of approaching conflict. One, there isn't any. Two, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and so the demonization of Putin, um, really the demonization of Russia, um, the isolation of Putin from Russia fails to recognize, you know, like a, a thousand years even of history, certainly hundreds of years of history, from ancient Rus, Kievan Rus, as it was known uh, centuries ago, um, on into the present, um, all of the uh, you know kind of uh, encirclement and um, paranoia uh, about the West that Russia has experienced, all of this stuff um, that has filled its culture for centuries, um, none of this is taken into account. So. Um, how exactly do we reverse this tendency towards entropy? Um, and we have answers to this, scientific uh, answers that can then be um, used as a, a model for imagining, because the actual answers uh, aren't capable of being, they're not, they're so complex that you can't apply them simplistically. Um, but for example, uh, there is a wonderful Belgian uh, scientist, won the Nobel Prize. His name is Ilya Prigogin. And he wrote a book called Order Out of Chaos. And what he describes is how systems, as they approach crises, self-organize in ways that um, uh, turn that export entropy into the you know kind of environment, but use it as a basis for higher orders of complexity. And there's an argument that says that what we are, what we have experienced in the history of the universe, um, is not just. Um, the increase in entropy, but also the increase in complexity. Um, and the question then is, how does entropy get used to turn, uh, get turned into complexity? Well, I think to begin with, we have to acknowledge that the second law of thermodynamics is correct and that whenever we create pockets of complexity uh, and higher order organization, uh, we there's a, a kind of total amount of disorder that, you know, kind of uh, increases over time. But um, the, so in other words, to put it slightly differently, the amount of energy that it takes 
um, to create a relationship between opposing nation states is much, much greater than the amount of energy that it takes to divide them. Mm-hmm. One simple uh, event can divide them, um, uh, uh, break their relationship. And it's true, of course, with marriages, with families, um, with societies as a whole. It takes very little to break relationships and a great deal of energy uh, to do something different. So the war in Ukraine as an example is not simply a solitary incident between two nation states with isolated issues, a unique history. All of those things are true. It is also uh, a major escalation in a very rapidly shifting global power contest to decide which countries, which political systems, which views of the world will dominate uh, and determine, get to determine the global future for everyone. Um, and this, of course, is incredibly significant. Um, but what we require in order to be able to solve the problem are methods of drawing people into political dialogue that allow them to actually work together to solve their problems. And we know that this works. We've seen it countless times. Um, And um, what the debate over democracy um, signifies, which is taking place around the world, uh, in Hungary, in the Middle East, um, in India, US, everywhere, um, is um, about whether, as I see it, is about whether or not we are going to move forward into uh, a kind of somewhat uncertain um, uh, uh, new relationship, collaborative relationship on a global scale. That is whether we're going to really talk to one another or whether we're going to instead um, solve our problems by imposing our solutions on them. In other words, move in the direction of war. You know, at at some level, we have the problem at the moment that the political leaderships of these different countries and nations that we are part of are locked into a contest that seems uh, inherently exclusionary and there's only a win-lose proposition on both ends. what What I wonder is, your model or your thinking, do you think that there's a civil society approach of creating a win-win uh, a, a basis upon which then can be built on in like later on politically? Because I view this whole thing as a lack, lack, of, a, lack of a better word, as a, as, a, as a cluster problem, right? Of, um, uh, that's the nice expression, right? Where we just don't get out of, 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 of the model we've, we, we, we have. So, but if, is there a civil society approach? Because you can see how politics is trying to inhibit that. And is we, we're inhibited now from, from forming human bonds on the ground. Um, do, you see, do you see a way forward there, civil society? Yes, I do. Um, this is not going to be easy and who knows whether the, what the, how the timing of it is going to be work, is going to work out. Um, but the, uh, uh, essentially what has to happen is that a, we have to reach a kind of critical mass in terms of the numbers of people who understand the need um, for change and the people who have a set of skills in collaborative problem solving that will allow us then to uh, come together in a way that is different. Let me just give a small example. Uh, I was asked by a very large organization, political organization in the United States that had thousands of chapters across the country that were promoting uh, in the last round of presidential elections, democratic candidates for the presidency. And the difficulty was that they had people who were very much pro-Biden, people who are pro-Sanders, people who are pro-Warren, etc. Uh, all of these different uh, factions. 
and they couldn't talk to one another. And what would happen is someone would stand up and say the word Bernie, as in Bernie Sanders, and immediately conversation would stop. And everybody knew exactly what everybody else thought and nothing needed, else needed to be said. So I was asked to help design a dialogue that could help these people talk to one another. Here are the first two questions that I came up with in the dial, in the, for the dialogue. Uh, question number one, without identifying which candidate you support, what do you believe are the values that your candidate stands for? Question two, how could we use those values to help us have a useful conversation right now that will make this country a better place for all of us to live in. So now two questions and we've got dialogue. Now, what are the two questions? They're designed to sidestep that uh, trap that you were mentioning before, uh, the place where we are stuck, uh, where we can't think outside of our own paradigm by asking a question that cannot be answered within the paradigm.